My name is James Trost, and this is A2 Insight. Today's guest is John Fike, President of Philanthropy Solutions, as well as Adjunct Professor of Nonprofit Management in the Political Science Department at Eastern Michigan University. John Fike, welcome to A2 Insight. Thank you, Jim. It's great to be here with you. Well, it's great to have you here. Uh, why don't we start out with you just giving us a little bit of background about growing up, where you grew up, early influences in your life, and uh, we'll move there and move on to your career in academic pursuit. So I'll let you start with your life growing up. Okay. I grew up in uh, Waynesboro and Huntington, Pennsylvania, which would be southern Pennsylvania and middle Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, I come from the uh, you know, German Baptist Brethren tradition, part of the what was, what was called the Radical Reformation of Germany. And uh, I belonged to, or I was part of the community of a, one, of the, uh, one of the famous peace churches in the United States. Uh, uh, this is uh, the Brethren, the Amish, the Mennonite, and so forth. Uh, these were the people who, during World War II, began alternative service as a way to uh, provide an alternative for those who uh, felt, as I did, that uh, uh, war was not appropriate uh, to participate in. And uh, during those early years, um, uh, the community of the church informed me, uh, inf informed my, if you will, the formation of my values relative to not only peace, but also to the interpretation of uh, scriptures and into uh, the values of, uh, of um, service and uh, internal introspection and uh, provided uh, the impetus for uh, the beginnings of a career, if you will, in protesting because one of the, my earliest experiences was going with the church community, I mean, and the national church community, uh, to Washington, D.C. to protest uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what we were doing in nuclear weapons and then later uh, for the, the Vietnam War. And so uh, uh, assembling and dissenting uh, were, <laughs> were very early experiences. So by the time I got to college, uh, when we were involved in the civil rights movement, uh, then it became uh, fairly natural uh, to think about uh, the issues of justice and freedom and equality for everyone. And why wasn't that being the case? And why were people um, uh, not only in the South, but in the North as well, so vociferous about denying uh, 12 or 15 percent of our population their rights. Uh, so um, this comes from uh, both a sense of my, uh, both my own sense of self as an individual, but also from my participation in a wider community that uh, uh, helped me to understand the needs of society, the needs of people in the society, and prompted me to do not only personal introspection and growth, but also to uh, lend a hand, to lend service to the society. And I f came up with the idea that I had a responsibility to in some way serve mm -hmm. the society that I was in. <coughs> That's interesting. You said you belong to the largest peace church, or the well, movement, one of the, one of the large peace yeah. churches. And of course, the Amish and the Mennonite we know, uh, those they don't serve, they, when war was called in World War II, based on their religious beliefs. And of course, you've been influenced strongly by the German Brethren, the church. And would you consider yourself, and this is just something I thought as an aside, 1965, 66, what would you have done if your draft number came up? Well, or would you, I mean, I'm just saying, are, would you consider yourself a pacifist at this point, given the history, given your religious no. upbringing? What would you have done if you were called, like so many at this time, a, a young man, what would you have done if you were told to go to Vietnam? Well, that came up. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah, the, old, <laughs> the draft board decided that I needed to, uh, that I came up in the draft, and so I... Uh, I said, no, I, I'm not willing to go to war. I'm a mm. conscientious objector. I'm mm. a pacifist, uh, and so forth and so on. But um, uh, as I was walking down that path, uh, I, it also turned out that my wife was pregnant, and I was also in school at the time. Mm. And so mm -hmm. 
they decided to rely on uh, those two things as a way to uh, excuse me from that service rather than on, my, on the basis of my pacifism. So that was a decision that they made, but the, both the practical reality and the philosophical uh, understanding were mine. Hmm. So, well, thankfully, the, uh, for whatever reason, you didn't have to go through that complete decision of how you were going to deal with this and the government well, let you go. Exactly how we were going to deal with it, well, I know mean, how you were going to deal with it. We don't know how, how uh, the government was going to deal with it, certainly at that time, or maybe a trek to Canada or whatever horror was going on for some. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I was prepared to go to Canada. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, whatever it took. Mm -hmm. uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, but uh, at that time, because it was ridiculous mm -hmm. to uh, participate in that kind of, in any kind of war. I mean, war is not a solution. War is what people do in order to dominate others. Well, what good is that? What good does that do for anybody? No, we have to learn to cooperate. Now, the one thing about this, we have, we're equipped as human beings with a cerebral cortex. Okay, that's our rational decision making. It's only 150,000 years old. We're still getting used to it. It took a long time, a couple of three million years, uh, to get our brains, uh, I mean our, our cranium, big enough to hold the cerebral cortex in the first place. Now we have to figure out how we do with reason on the one hand and emotion on the other as components in our decision making. And what happens is we tend to make very bad decisions when we're relying on anything but a combination of those two ingredients. And so we, um, we uh, tend to like to dominate people. We like to uh, feel, I want to be king of the hill. You know, we tend to think of uh, uh, status and we tend to think of uh, free money. Uh, so I want status, I want rents as the French would call it. Um, I want money uh, that I can uh, get uh, as cheaply as possible. So um, the decision to go to war, the decision to beat up on somebody, the decision to coerce is not a good decision. It's not the best that we can do as human beings. The best that we can do as human beings is to work and figure it out together and get together and uh, understand common goals and common values so that we can also figure on common purpose and what kind of things will serve our common purpose. Mm -hmm. So war is a, is a trash response, but cooperation is a much better productive mm -hmm. response. Well, as a young man, you decided to attend a small liberal arts college called Juniata in Pennsylvania, I believe near Penn State or in College Station there in the eastern part of in, in Pennsylvania? Yes, southern, uh, excuse me, central uh, Pennsylvania. And what motivated you to attend that institution and what did you study? Uh, what motivated me really was the fact that it was a liberal arts college and that it was well known and it was probably one of the most advanced colleges at that time. Uh, and it was a small college and I wanted that kind of small college environment. Um, I wanted those sorts of emphases on the uh, liberal arts values wanted that kind of an education. Hmm. So it was good to be there. Uh, my father happened to be the Vice President of Financial Affairs at the time, made it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And you also, with your aversion or <laughs> understanding of not the purposelessness of war and certainly people getting pushed around by society, you decided to take off yourself along with 20 other uh, students at Juniata and register people in the 60s in the South. What was that experience like? Hair raising, actually. Um, it was quite a decision to go down there because I had to alienate half my family to do it. But why, why, it excuse me, why, why, why did that alienate your family? There was a lot of racism in my family. And it wasn't necessarily always apparent, hmm. but when it comes to an issue, then all of a sudden uh, the racism creeps out of the closet and starts presenting itself as much more of an entity than you ever thought it was. But uh, the other thing uh, that moved me was the fact that people were getting beat up for wanting to vote. And that just really just hit me the wrong way. Um, uh, voting is part of what we think democracy is all about. 
and why should some people uh, not be allowed to vote? Why should they not be allowed to exercise that right? Uh, so um, I went down with the other 21 people and we began to register people to vote, but we also uh, began to uh, uh, bring people together for an anticipated march um, over the uh, Pettus Bridge from mm. Selma to Montgomery, uh, which uh, was um, a historic event that I didn't get to witness, but I was there the previous week or so <laughs> trying to get people ready to, uh, to, to go on that uh, march. And in the meantime, uh, while we were there, we were confronted by the state, the mounted state troopers um, uh, on the uh, campus of Alabama State University. Uh, <clears throat> when you say confronted, uh, what, what, is that, what does that entail? <laughs> well, they basically rode over us, uh, pretty much slipshod, uh, beat quite a few of the people who had come with me. I was, uh, uh, I, I saw what was happening and moved the other way. Uh, but um, uh, still, that was a pretty rough afternoon uh, when they did that. And uh, so many of the people, or I shouldn't say many, but several of the people that had come with us were badly beaten. And uh, there's a fairly good historical uh, and photographical record about that because there was a fellow, uh, I can't remember, I think his name might have been Phillips, uh, who was um, uh, a photographer at that time and a journalist. and uh, he covered that whole thing, and it's, his photographs have been published in numerous sources uh, mm. from that time. I do want to move on to, again, the main purpose of this is I want our, our viewers to be learn more about your knowledge in the nonprofit world, but I do want to ask you something now because this does lead to a, a question that I really would be interested in hearing, given your activism not only in uh, the voter drives and civil rights and, and your, up, your religious upbringing, and your view, long-term view, not only your academic view, but your experiential view, racism in America 2017, given your lifelong devotion and fighting of some of the evils we have in our society, is our society better today than it was when you were waltzing down there on the buses and trying to help people? Obviously, it's not perfect, but have you seen, what do you honestly believe our society has gone to, or where are we today in terms of all of your efforts. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future in this country? Well, human society has not changed substantially since the Roman Empire. We're still the same people. We're still making the same decisions. We're still uh, very interested in dominating one another. And that was true in the various wars of the 20th century. And it's true now. And when you think about it, uh, there are uh, ways of being, there's ways of governing. So we go from governance by uh, uh, monarchy, to governance by an oligarchy, we can have what we think might be uh, an in interstice of democracy or democratic thinking, and then we go back to nationalism again, okay? And nationalism is based on ethnicity or it's based on uh, resources or it's based on uh, uh, the prejudices between ethnics. So, you know, today we're not appreciably better and hopefully not appreciably worse than any human culture has been capable of being. But there have been times through history when we've seen breakthroughs and one of those was in China during the Han Dynasty where we, the ideas about governance began to take form around the idea of responsibility and the ideas of uh, accountability and prudence and wisdom and then some other, uh, uh, another, another kind of uh, uh, interstice was uh, the uh, founders of our nation as they were thinking through uh, parts of the Constitution. Now we also have to say that yes, parts of those folks were also dominating folks and they were aristocracy and they were, uh, you know, they were the uh, uh, elites but they were intellectual enough to think about uh, having a system that would include people in ordinary life. As long as they were male and had property, okay. But nevertheless, the idea was there. And you can see this uh, erupting from time to time in other uh, cultures around the world. 
Uh, and one of those times where it lasted for a couple hundred years was in Greece, and then uh, for us another couple of hundred years. And whether or not it will actually become a part of the human uh, repertoire on a long-term basis, who is to say? Well, I guess I <coughs> will, will say that as maybe a neutral <laughs> assumption. Uh, you don't necessarily believe in the arc of, of history being one of justice or equality slowly or moving. No. So the, I, the mm -hmm. idea that we are somehow progressing uh, towards some uh, great uh, divinely uh, inspired or divinely oriented uh, 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 great end, I think, mm -hmm. is rubbish. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that uh, we are working with a cerebral cortex that is developing. And I think as it continues to develop, if we allow our planet to exist uh, for another uh, 50,000 years, uh, we'll be able to have the ability to decide in ways that are different from what we've been doing for the last 150,000. Mm -hmm. But evolution works very slow. And whether or not we will blow ourselves up by that time is anybody's guess. Mm -hmm. Well, that's <laughs> reassuring, I suppose, or not. Uh, as I said, you remember, this is one of my uh, former professors, so I just love listening to it. But I do want us to get back to uh, the nonprofit world, because you are at, uh, with a variety of, of career choices and so on. And we're going to move now into your experience closer to home here in Michigan when you were hired as the major gift donor at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Many years ago? No, I was not the major donor, but the major gift uh, director. <laughs> major, the major, oh, that's right. You mean you weren't the major donor, you were the major gift director <laughs> at the, uh, I, but, uh, well, and indirectly, I suppose it might be right given what you achieved, but uh, I'd like just to move into your work at the Detroit, and your interest and fascination with the nonprofit world, so. Experience, and that was a good, kind of training because it helped me uh, and many others, uh, of course, to um, uh, understand that an action is really not just an action. It's a decision, it's an action, it's a reflection, and it's learning all, from the, all at the same time. So there are various stages to uh, an experience. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, Yes, I uh, went uh, to work then after uh, graduation in 69 uh, for the uh, general offices of the Church of the Brethren, which is a uh, small Protestant denomination in the uh, German Anabaptist tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things we can say about that is that the, my, uh, my family, my uh, church community and so forth, was born, if you will, in the 17th century in Germany uh, in the Radical Reformation that took place. And uh, one of the things that is, uh, I think, remarkable about the Radical Reformation in Europe was that um, it combined an emphasis on individual, individual decision, individual interpretation of the scriptures, individual faith, with a strong emphasis on community and that the individual exists in the community and that the community is important and the society is important and so that one should have a certain amount of, if you will, piety, a certain amount of uh, individual uh, self-inspection, uh, uh, self-learning, um, uh, but also have a sensitivity toward the society and what the society, what's happening in the society. Now that was very new for Europe because Europe went right from the authoritarianism of the church into individualism, mm -hmm. okay? And here we have a radical sect that says, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Individualism is fine and the individual interpretation of the scriptures and individual uh, learning and introspection is fine, but it has to be in the context of community, the larger society, and what are you doing? for the larger society. So we have two emphases. One is piety, the other is service. Service to the society, service to the community. And so that one's individual actions are governed by the community, but the community's actions are also are governed by individuals and individual rights. And so this is a dialogue. And this was very new for Europe. I and mean, Europe never has caught on with it. America has never caught on with it. But it came originally from 
China and the East, across the steppes, uh, in the various migrations of, of, excuse me, millions of refugees coming across for about 6,000 years into Central, Eastern, and then Central, and then Western Europe. Mm. Okay, so this is getting a little bit uh, <clears throat> well, it's, up there. But, uh, but it's also very, it, it is very interesting. Um, and again, I, I want to say, because obviously with that tradition, you know, there certainly would be someone very actively interested in the civil rights movement and seeing being part of a community making a difference. Did you ever meet Dr. King? I ran into him frequently, actually, because um, uh, SCLC, uh, for about uh, eight or nine months or so, uh, rent, uh, had their offices in our church. They rented a space from us because uh, they got, uh, 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 they, needed, they needed more space. They, had, they got to kind of uh, hamstrung down on Ashland Avenue. They came out to Warren Avenue, and so we were running up and down the stairs with SCLC staff, and it was a great time because we got to meet with them, talk with them, work with them, uh, that sort of thing. Of course, Dr. King was not there very much at sure. the time, mm -hmm. uh, but it did happen, uh, and um, uh, it was a great experience to be part of that community. Absolutely. That's yeah. a wonderful experience. Uh, as, as an aside, I can remember my, my parents mentioning that they went to a dinner in 1965 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where my father was a, a pastor at a church there, and they remember the security around Dr. King. In fact, my godfather was hauled away because he was just hanging around in front of the president's house at Franklin and Marshall College. Mm. But I'm just wondering, given obviously what happened to Dr. King, was there ever, I mean, at this time he obviously is a leading figure in the country, was he protected? Or oh, did yeah. you sense that there were people protecting him even at that Always. point? Yeah. Always. Yeah. Apparently not at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. Well, they were there too, but you can't be with somebody 100% of the time. Yeah, true, and assassination is a, has a long, sad history in our own country. It does. Uh, well, again, going through that dramatic experience, and you were in Chicago, and then we're going to get you a little bit closer here to us in, in the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti region. You've decided to evolve with your philosophy degree and then move beyond even the ministry and then some of your civil rights work to become a fundraiser at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And I'm taking some things out of context, but I'm going to try to move us along. That's an interesting uh, movement, given you know, your background. What was the interest in the, well, I guess I'll do it in two ways, both the Detroit Institute and the Salvation Army, which you also were actively involved with. What were your roles in those organizations? Yes. Uh, basically, uh, in both organizations, I was the major in planned gifts officer. Okay. Uh, and my career in fundraising began in Chicago, actually, uh, when I uh, had a mentor from uh, Northwestern University, Wilson Schroeder, who uh, challenged me while I was in the, by the way, I was in the furniture business at that mm -hmm. time, uh, to uh, think about uh, fundraising as a career. And uh, mm -hmm. he, he kind of worked on me over a period of months. And, uh, so I agreed that uh, we, I would do this. I, I, I became a member of the National Society of Fundraising Executives there, worked on that for a while in Chicago, did fundraising for a group called the Center for Parish Development, and then came to Chicago, okay. Chicago mm -hmm. uh, with the Salvation Army. Uh, hmm. And uh, so there was some continuity there, uh, both in terms of decision and in terms of working up into the profession. Uh, so by the time I got to the DIA, I had my uh, certification. I had 10, 10 or 15 years in the, in the business, and um, mm. uh, I was hired away from the Salvation Army by the, the DIA at the time when Governor Enger cut uh, the budget <laughs> of the DIA by $8 million, which was one uh, quarter or 25% of our budget. And so I was the first new hire after 100. 59 people were fired due to that budget cut, which meant that I was not in the museum. I was housed in the, uh, you know, across the street. Uh, and uh, really, the place was bleeding at mm -hmm. that time. But I'll tell you something uh, phenomenal, and that is that when I came in in January, from there to May, we decided that we need, uh, on what kind of a program we needed to uh, uh, raise that eight million per year, uh, but also by uh, August, we from May to August, we uh, 
put that campaign on the road, and in 18 months we raised $27 million on a $24 million goal. Okay, so you can see <coughs> that we were busy. Uh, and you can also see that the public responded very well to that. Uh, and uh, they um, uh, really, I think, the concept of what the art is, what the arts are for, and who enjoys them, and who is responsible for funding them, and who is responsible for uh, promoting them in the community, began to have more clarity during that time. Because for the previous 103 years, when, when we got started with that, when I left it was 108 years, um, in our beginning, there was no sense in which uh, people really understood, maybe other than a few elites, what the arts were for. But I think by the time we were done that campaign, there, was, there had been much more discussion about what is art about, what is it for, who's going to appreciate it. And so therefore, uh, we began to be able to have programs like Art to the Schools and um, uh, other kinds of uh, programming to the community, and we began to focus on the general public, not just on the elites who were collectors, mm -hmm. not just on the elites, the elites who were govern governing and who were uh, high up in business, but um, we began to make this much more of a, uh, a plebeian sort of mm -hmm. thing, a, uh, something for the masses, that art, as a matter of fact, can make you smarter. Art can make kids uh, uh, smarter in the sense of the skills that they uh, are uh, fostering uh, when they're making things, mm -hmm. uh, when they're uh, putting things together, when they're painting and uh, whatnot. Uh, so uh, we began to understand that art contributes to education and contributes to the general society in the sense of making smarter people, which is exactly what we need if we're going to ever have a democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that, that we could go in a lot of directions, but I think what fascinates me most is here you, you waltz in here, well not waltz, but you were hired in an organization that had previously <laughs> let go 197 piece, seven, seven people, and then within the course of 18 months you raised more than 25 million. I guess the question I would have, what kind of skills does a position like being a major gifts officer require that could achieve those kinds of results? Uh, it would seem to me that's somewhat of, regardless of your faith in the arts and everything else, I would assume that there's a specific kind of skills from your own experience that obviously they saw. What, what, what kind of skills create such a remarkable return on their investment, I guess I would say? The most important skill is working with people because you don't raise money by yourself. A major gifts officer works in a context of people, a context of donors, a context of volunteers, a context of administrators. And so uh, you have, you know, the office kinds of jobs where, which, you know, keep track of uh, who's giving and uh, what their gift was and, and keep uh, track of uh, how close we are to our goal and that sort of thing. But, Everything else is out in the field, out, out with the donors. And so it, uh, it really involves personal contact in a lot of different ways. Uh, our volunteers, our board members, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, volunteers in uh, education and that sort of thing, and all of our staff, the curatorial staff, the education staff were involved in working with prospects. And so uh, we, we keep track of that, but it also takes a lot of people to make all those gifts. So uh, it's not so much the skills of an individual, it's not so much the pride that an individual takes in having participated in that kind of thing, it's the fact that we had thousands of people asking thousands of people for money on a continuing basis. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess the question with that would be, assuming that I am one of the uh, a wealthy potential donor, it seems to me that you would have to, I would have to assume if I'm going to donate a substantial amount of money, what am I getting out of it? What are you, what is the, and again, the Detroit Institute started to, there's magnificent stuff, which of course, thankfully, they didn't sell off for some of their financial issues, but I'm oh. just, I'm just saying, if you're approaching me, you That's know. That's just something the media bring up every eight or 10 years. 
what that they're going to sell the stuff off yeah. or all this. But but again, it is. It, I would. I granted, it's it's, a, it's. There's a lot of people involved, and there's volunteers. But you know, you know who's got the money, and you know how to approach them. And I guess the point is, is is it truly altruism that people give money, or is is there some kind of a, is it sometimes a little self-focused? It varies a great deal. It depends who, on the person. It depends mm -hmm. on their background. It depends on their understanding of art. But uh, there are a lot of different reasons that people give. Mm -hmm. And you can, uh, a person might give because uh, they want to give back to the community in a general mm -hmm. way. And here's the Art Institute uh, just about going down the drains. Mm -hmm. uh, let's help them. Okay. But then you have collectors uh, who are very much involved. Uh, you have makers of art. You have artists uh, who are very much involved um, in the art scene. Um, you have, uh, for instance, uh, business people who uh, like to say that their top executives enjoy art and they want to hire people as top executives uh, to come mm. to the Detroit area, okay, so they want to have a museum in the Detroit area. Mm. And it's really something to say that, okay, we're the sixth best museum in the world. And our people are um, involved in that museum, okay? But if the, muse if the museum isn't there, they can't mm -hmm. say that. They don't have that. So there are a lot of different reasons why uh, people gave to that campaign and why people give generally to charity. Mm -hmm. It just depends on the, the kind of mindset that they have developed and the kind of neural associations that they have with the given charity and what it does and the people that it serves and their own experience. Hmm. So very often I've found, for example, that uh, a key gift depends on making a connection in the donor's mind, in the donor's psyche, between something that happened to them a long time ago, or maybe not so long ago, and what your mission is and the people that you're uh, uh, serving in the community. And once you can make that connection between the donor's life and the life of the uh, uh, program recipient, in this case the general public for art, you know. Once that connection is made, then uh, they feel that they're getting their, their goal accomplished through our mission. Mm -hmm. Interesting, and I, I guess the other aspect of that that I find fascinating, particularly it, given where the Detroit Institute of Arts was prior to your arrival, um, is it possible sometimes that a nonprofit organization or a motivation for giving is through an organization's failure or the potential demise that somehow now it's, it's getting to the point if, if Detroit hadn't laid off 197 people yeah, and was struck, I'm sorry, 159, yeah. I'm just saying, I mean, yeah. is, it, is it the desperation sometimes that can be a motivator on the part of donors? Not, that, not to minimize, I'm just saying that is it sometimes that fear of losing such a wonderful institution that could have, benefit, could have contributed to this growth of, of giving. Crisis hmm. means awareness. So it, maybe you've been coasting along for a long time. Maybe you've been saying, maybe I should at some point give to the DIA or give to the Salvation Army. And then all of a sudden a crisis hits and you say, ah, okay, now it's time for me to do this. Why? Because I have a stake in the organization. Mm. I have a, because I have a stake maybe in the mission of the organization. And maybe I've been you know, messing around with other things and haven't been too conscious, but all of a sudden the crisis brings us to focus. And so, you remember the Jessica in the well? Mm -hmm. Okay, so people like to focus on a specific kind of thing. Mm. Uh, a specific, a specific person, a specific uh, potential, maybe even negative outcome in the society, and that can move mm. people to become aware and mm -hmm. to give. Huh. Very interesting. Okay. Well, now let's move on to a actually a, an entrepreneurial endeavor of yours. We're going to have to uh, move it a little bit along. You s decided after a, certainly a after Detroit Institute Art and some of your fundraising experience and you've done over the years and bringing the philosophy together that you studied in college and began an organization uh, called Philanthropy Solutions. Could you tell us a little bit more about what the mission of that organization is and, and uh, why you started that and what, it, what, what function it performs in our, in our community? I started Philanthropy Solutions because I wanted to be able to train people in charities 
particularly boards and staff, about fundraising. I wanted to share with them some of my experiences, but also I, was, I began to be much more concerned than I had been previously about how charities are managed. Mm. And uh, as a fundraiser uh, with two rather large organizations, uh, one a national organization, but having uh, a local uh, outlet, and then the DIA, uh, another very large organization, I began to see that there are ways in which the management of an organization can really interfere with its fundraising. And yet it needs that money, and so it needs to change its management style in order to be able to raise the continuing, hopefully, more money that they need. And uh, so I started Philanthropy Solutions as an educational effort. And basically what I did was to work with boards and work with staff uh, on training them how to uh, be good fundraisers, but also in the process, how to be good boards, how to have an effective board, how to make decisions as a board uh, relative to um, the community and to fundraising in such a way that the organization would be strengthened. Um, charity is not that responsible. Charity mm -hmm. is not necessarily that accountable to the larger society. And there's a lot of board members that sort of pride themselves on not being uh, accountable to anybody. I mean, mm -hmm. but <laughs> really, uh, they are <laughs> accountable to the people of the community. And so recognizing this, and of course there's, uh, you know, I'm not the only one out here saying this. John Carver, for example, is one of the premier uh, 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 intellectuals on board training and board uh, work. And uh, so he would say that the board's ultimate accountability is toward the public, not toward the organization. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for at least enlightening us with some information about the nonprofit world and the challenges it faces and your contributions to it. Uh, for A2 Insight, thank you again, uh, Mr. Fike. I'm James Trost. Until next time. Privileged.